throughout our convention so far, we've uh, spent a lot of time talking about the power that working people have when they're able to work together towards common goals. Uh, that power is demonstrated in the workplace, at the bargaining table, in our communities, and it's, of course, also demonstrated on the political stage. Uh, our next speaker is going to uh, share with us some stories and some lessons from uh, literally the other side of the world uh, regarding a campaign organized by our brothers and sisters in Australia that demonstrated the power of working people and unions uh, on their political stage. In particular, uh, we have taken note of campaigns organized in Australia by unions and their labor centrals, uh, especially a campaign called Your Rights at Work. Um, we're going to hear more detail about it, but in a nutshell, it was a political action campaign launched in a pre-election period that allowed workers and unions to make labor rights the central is issue in a federal election, um, despite all the arguments from the pundits saying that you couldn't make that the central part of an election. Workers working together through their unions were able to do just that, and it turned an election. So uh, we've invited uh, our next guest up to talk about that campaign, to talk about uh, what it meant and what lessons uh, we can learn from our brothers and sisters in the Australian labor movement when making our plans uh, for political action here in Alberta. Uh, so we are joined by Kathy Muir. Kathy uh, first worked for Australian unions as a trade union banner artist in the 1980s. Uh, lady Ka later, Kathy moved to the Center for Labor Studies at the University of Adelaide, where she became a researcher and senior lecturer specializing in labor and social movement uh, and their use of uh, media and campaigning. Kathy is also the author of Worth Fighting For, Inside the Your Rights at Work campaign, uh, which is an incredible account of the labor movement campaign that changed the 2007 federal election in Australia. Uh, the Australian campaign uh, provides valuable lessons for us in Canada, demonstrating the power of working people to influence politics and the value of public campaigns. Please join me in welcoming Sister, Sister Kathy Muir. Brothers and sisters, thank you for inviting me to share some of our common challenges and the strategies to deal with them. It's a privilege to be here with you and I've really enjoyed the four days of the conference that I've seen, the parts that I've been to. Before I start on the story of Australian workers, work, Australian unions work to overcome conservative governments and anti-union, anti-worker legislation, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the First Nations traditional owners past and present of this country and to pay tribute to their work of caring for country and their battle to get justice for their people past and present. So here we sit on opposite sides of the Pacific, with a newly rampant right wing in both our countries, which has taken heart from the election of Donald Trump and his deliberate outspoken offensiveness to people of colour, to women, to progressives, to immigrants, and to workers who try to organise for progressive change. Uncaring, irresponsible populism is the new buzz speak. And many, sadly, of our own members are using that freedom to blame others for their problems in ways that may not reflect reality, but which relieves their pent up frustrations of not being listened to, not having had a wage increase, not having been respected, not having been treated fairly, or not having had a standard of living in for, increase for many years. The Tories, the alt right, and the neoconservative politicians love this, as it's a distraction from being held accountable to the real effects of their policies. They and their supporters in the USA and increasingly in our own countries are in the forefront of efforts to erode workers' pay and entitlements, to outsource their jobs to casual labour hire contracts, and to change laws to make legal such disgraceful treatment of workers. As workers, we are being told stories that aim to divide us. But we are stronger together, and we need each other. The choice is not between jobs of electricity sector workers or the environment. 
nor is it the choice of work, jobs of workers in downtown Edmonton versus the jobs in Grand Prairie or Fort McMurray. Just as in my home state of South Australia, it's not the choice of jobs in the outer suburbs of Adelaide or in the regional cities of Wyala. And it's not the choice between a pension for single mothers and services in the bush. In Australia, in 2007, the Australian unions overcame great odds to win a federal, national election away from John Howard's conservative coalition government and his extreme anti-union, anti-worker work choices legislation to a decisive win for the Australian Labor Party. That election revolved around definitions of fairness, of rights and of decency. And it raised the question of the kind of society Australia wanted to be into the future. The unions achieved this through three solid years of campaigning, of research into the electorate's mood, in particular into the thoughts and the feelings of their members, through campaigning hard on the ground in the community and in workplace organising, and through an enormous amount of discipline, hard work and self-belief. The All Rights at Work campaign was necessary as in 2004, the Conservatives won an absolute majority in both our House of Representatives and in our Senate. And that was the first time they'd had an absolute majority in 23 years. So they had absolute control to implement an extremely anti-union agenda. They were salivating at the chance and the employers were urging them on. They wanted to restrict the activities of unions and to slash workers' rights and entitlements. The range of legislation that was proposed was vast. But some of the critical elements included the establishment of a royal commission into the building and construction industry, designed to massively attack the construction unions, not the employers or the contractors. The proposed laws also abolished the award system, slashing the number of regulated conditions and entitlements, leaving workers to individually negotiate many of their central conditions with employers, and few workers have the skills to do that effectively. So the very week after the election, the Australian Council of Trade Unions Executive met to map out both a defensive strategy to try and limit the damage of the laws and an offensive campaign to try and change the government at the next election. The strategy took five months to evolve into a comprehensive multi-layered campaign, including everything from legal challenges, challenges at the state, that is the provincial level, to intensive research into the best ways to frame the messaging of the campaign to achieve the greatest resonance with swinging voters, including the union members. Two key elements were an extensive political advertising campaign and a coordinated campaign in 24 marginal seats, what you'd call ridings, across the country. The most obvious goals of the campaign was to defeat the Howard government and to elect a worker-friendly Labor government that would promise to repeal the laws. But unions also recognised this was an opportunity to build both the profile and the membership of unions and to position them once again publicly as the champions of fairness and decency and as protectors of ordinary working families who were bearing the biggest burden of these unfair laws. Our unions brought out some similar approaches at the most recent federal election last year and managed to reduce the current Conservative coalition government majority from 18 seats to just one seat in the House of Representatives and that one seat was won by a mere 37 votes. So we're well positioned for the next election in 2019 and the unions are campaigning, planning their campaign now. As in Canada, the, rise, the rising gap between low-paid and precariously or informally employed workers and those in the professions and in business is growing massively every year. This is a central issue for union action in the next three years, and it's one I'll come back to in a minute. But first, we need to understand the scale of the union campaign that made the 2007 victory possible. Despite the Labor Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, claiming it was his enormous personal following that won it, I argue it was instead and the unprecedented and sophisticated campaign run by the unions that shifted the numbers and defined the issues. In the wake of the 2007 Your Rights at Work campaign, when many on the right as well as on the left were talking about and puzzling about its spectacular success in shifting votes, media commentators, academics and political analysts speculated on the key ingredients and many credited the television advertising campaign with achieving a shift in the electorate's mood. We probably won't have time, I've got two 30 seconds ads, I'll leave them to the end, if we've got time we'll see them, but I know we're pressed for time. So those TV ads included some of the most realistic representations of the feelings of ordinary people yet seen on national television. And the ads were, though, reflecting back what people were already saying. 
They were very important in framing the general public discussion and extending the awareness of the impact of the proposed laws, but they amplified the feeling that the new laws were unfair. They didn't create that feeling, and they amplified the feeling the government had gone too far, that it had taken away people's basic rights, and that to do so was un-Australian. The ads did not create that mood. Instead, it was the old trade union principle, the education principle, that organising is built around things that are widely thought and deeply felt. That was really what was at play here. The extensive use of professional research and polling agencies to conduct focus groups was controversial at first. After all, most union secretaries and organisers believe they know what their members think. But focus groups and that kind of research gives you a deeper insight into how people think and to how they express themselves, how they interact together and how they do so when it's only a neutral person present. The extensive research conducted for unions both amongst their members and focus groups demonstrated time and time again that middle Australians were outraged by Howard government's proposed removal of many of their rights at work, and they used that word rights. It was interesting that non-union workers also believed they had rights, even though they weren't union members, and they supported the union's campaigning on these matters. Fairness came up many times too, but fairness was seen as a loose concept that couldn't be tied down. So the range of TV ads included the real-life stories of various workers who had been unfairly dismissed or had been sacked and then offered their jobs back on greatly reduced pay. They included ads which included a mother wondering how on earth she was going to look after her children at the last minute when she was called into work and the boss had threatened her with the sack if she didn't come in. And a father who was worrying about how he was going to look after his, his kid when his wife was working on the Friday night and he was, that was his time for looking after the child and he'd been asked to do an extra shift and they couldn't work on Saturday morning because he coached the footy team. So they brought them into the heart of the family dynamic. They made them very relatable to other people and they also brought in the whole kitchen table economics side. So the framing, um, the framing of these ads was based on some of the comments that came out in the polling, and it was invaluable new information that became central to crafting not only the ads, but also the community campaign and the one-to-one -one conversations that were such an important part of it. Now, despite the influence of the ACTU advertising campaign and its well-crafted messaging, it was, as I said, merely giving voice that a message that was right for its time. People were fed up with the Conservatives, they were seen as mean and out of touch, and the attack on their rights and the removal of critical protections was just the last straw. It was built on the belief that it was un-Australian and undemocratic to attack workers' basic rights and conditions. And of course, one, one difference between our situation and yours is that it's actually building a strong campaign to throw out an unpopular government is easier than building one to keep a government in. That may be doing a good job, but some people are probably thinking, well, is it doing it fast enough? It was most important to realise that your rights at work wasn't anything new to the union movement. It wasn't a magical new silver bullet. It was a campaign built on the core union business of organising, educating and talking attentively to people about the things that mattered to them. One of the key ingredients was discipline. The Australian union movement was magnificently disciplined throughout the entire three-year campaign. The strategy was debated, hotly at times, then it was adopted and people stuck to it likewise to the message. Certain unions that had very specific and significant grievances, such as the construction unions, who along with their members were being viciously attacked through outrageous legislation that set up the Australian Building and Construction Commission and removed their rights, realised that although extreme, their case would not swing general public support on its own. And that the sight of large numbers of furious construction workers massing in central cities on TV news would not get the wider message across as to why the laws needed to be defeated. This matter was critical because in Australia, we have very close ties between the ALP and the unions, and therefore demonising unions is a favourite tactic of the right, who are seeking to discredit labour figures and politicians. So our conservative parties, right-wing commentators and media consistently use the image and description of union thugs and bullies to attempt to discredit the legitimacy of the union movement. And they repeatedly show photos and footage of angry men yelling, especially, sadly, older, overweight men, and any records that they can find of trade unionists, especially leaders, behaving badly or with any actual or implied violence. These images and stories are given maximum coverage by the media to try and paint unionists as other to the values, behaviour and beliefs of ordinary working Australians. 
So recognising this, unions knew it was important not to give ammunition to enemies to assassinate their message. So the strategy of foregrounding a wide range of workers, and especially women, younger and more obviously vulnerable workers, prevailed. And the Australian unions were extraordinarily disciplined. Their debates took place behind closed doors and there were no leakage or public criticism of the decisions once taken from either the left or the right. And that is a historic truce. The central coordination of the campaign was the next vital ingredient to its success. The ACTU managed to coordinate and plan the campaign down to very fine details. Individual unions at both national and state provincial level and the state-based Trades and Labor Council took some actions on their own, but they always fitted with and added to the overall strategy rather than competing with it. The size of the Australian union movement is such that it could raise significant resources and reach into key areas of the country. Throughout the campaign, the ACTU raised a levy on affiliates starting at $3.50 per member, later raised to $5.50 per member for the campaign funding. Now, individuals and peak councils generally have expertise in organising and in educating members, in getting people active in response to the crisis, in building morale and a sense of community. And these intrinsic union skills were critical to the success of the campaign. Of course, it could have found it if it had all been top down and not met with and embraced by the organisers and activists, both at the workplace and the community level. But it was successful as it worked across both dimensions and instilled in people on the ground a deep sense of purpose, of being part of something historic, special and valuable. In 24 marginal electorates across the country, unions funded organisers to work closely with the community and to build the campaign over a 12-month period. Volunteers were educated in the political context of the campaign, in the kind of ways that issues are framed and debated, and the kind of conversations that work best with people if you're trying, one, to, work, to find out what their concerns are, and two, to shift their vote. Your rights at work built deep and lasting friendships, and people learnt new skills they could take into other areas of their lives. The number of people who told me how they had grown throughout the campaign was remarkable. Comments included the one up there from Roger, a retiree working tirelessly in the campaign in the outer suburb of Sydney. He said, it's an opportunity to give something back. After all, I've reaped the rewards of all the hard work of people who came before me and fought for the conditions that I enjoyed. And of Linda, who said the campaign was life-changing for her. I have to say this campaign has changed my life in showing that the little person can make a difference and have a voice, and that all the little people talking and making a difference can affect huge change. And on a personal level, I'm much more confident and a lot happier. For Linda too, the people she met in the campaign and the bonds they built were very important. She said, it's like you've been waiting to meet these people your entire life. And other people said that about that campaign. It had that magnetism, that involvement, that charisma of being part of something historic. Australian unions were faced with the challenge of simplifying and communicating the complex changes contained in numerous pieces of legislation, over 700 pages in all, into a few clear messages they could repeat time and time again across the three-year campaign. And they had to make it live for people so that people could see how they or their family might be affected. They got people to focus on the kind of society they wanted Australia to be in the future. They needed to change the minds of people, many of whom were union members, who had been convinced by the Conservatives, John Howard, claimed to be the government for the battlers who wanted to get ahead. In the 2004-2007 period, the ACTU and State Labor Councils organised mass protests and rallies, days of action, with several coordinated nationally to all tune into a central message and a highly staged managed event from Melbourne. This was broadcast through Sky Channel, the racing channel that goes to 150 locations around the nation. This was a very unusual strategy, something we'd never tried before, and it had both advantages and disadvantages. For many workers in regional areas, it was a thrill to be part of a big national event, and this encouraged far more people to turn out than would have before, and it gained at press coverage, in though all those small little towns would never put an industrial issue or a political campaign on the front page of their paper. But we're a big country like yours, and the diverse time zones meant there were real challenges with workers in the far west who received a delayed telecast after the event had been over for some hours, which really detracted from their enthusiasm. 
The slick presentation and unified message was a um, dramatic departure from many previous rallies. It attracted quite a lot of inherently positive media coverage as the clips and the speeches were replayed on news broadcasts. So you got your own message across rather than it being reworded by someone else. And it certainly added to that sense that something big was happening. It also satisfied the urge of many unions to demonstrate their determination to feat the government and fight the laws through the traditional feet on the street action. It made the members and the officials feel strong and effective. But such events take a huge amount of resources to coordinate, and they do not in themselves garner new support. They take a huge amount of time of key personnel, and they're expensive. So probably in the future, we're less likely to coordinate those big national events in the same way, unless there's a new compelling and outrageous attack on unions and working people that requires that kind of mass public response. The assessment of where effort is best placed could rank those events to be of lower priority for national co um, coordination. Now, you all know how important social media and having a strategy of social media is these days. Many unions have got very, very useful and very dynamic individual sites and Twitter feeds, and their members engage widely with other forms of social media, getting the messages out far and wide. These approaches assist in raising issues with younger people who don't care about politics and don't engage with traditional sources of news. But of course, these efforts are also a little bit more random because we don't always know what will take off and what won't. And there's the difficulty of allowing people to do or say what they want in open forums, on Twitter, on Facebook, and so on. And certainly, Your Rights at Work had some significant problems with trolls and with flaming in the latter stages. And it was too hard to moderate the contributions quickly, which resulted in the forums losing some of their effectiveness. But the online campaign was useful for raising funds for specific strategies, raising 50,000 in five days for a huge billboard on the Tullamoraine freeway outside of Melbourne. And sometimes individual efforts work magnificently. <coughs> One young um, activist and childcare uh, uh, um, activist and union member was also a video maker in his spare time, and he made a hilarious satirical video that he showed his union, who put it on their website, and it went viral. It was called 36 Ways to Get Fired under John Howard, and it contained both serious messages about the things that were not protected and some delightfully silly scenarios. In another instant, the Construction, Forestry, Mining and Energy Union commissioned Canadians from the political satire team, The Chaser, to make some television ads for them. And one was particularly successful. Called What Have Unions Ever Done For Us? It found a comedic way of listing the gains that the union movement has won that we value today. And since then, it's been picked up and remade, or sometimes just revoiced, by unions and peak councils internationally, including in the USA, Britain, Ireland, and Germany. And I've got the link up there that if you want to follow it up. So comedy allows the political message to reach a viewer in a relaxed frame of mind and may have an impact on someone who would otherwise instantly turn off or reject something they saw as specific political messaging. Clever political satire also generates its own conversations across lunchrooms, bars, social media in a way that's hard to quantify. Perhaps these tactics are not critical to the campaign overall, but they provide pleasure and satisfaction to the campaign workers and to the members. They instill fun into the chore of campaigning, and they engage the interest of some folk, especially younger workers, who would not respond to the more traditional arguments. And they create a second, even a third dimension as the message gets passed on. Little actions at the local level are invaluable for provoking conversations between neighbours and other locals, as well as increasing a sense of ownership in campaigns. Signs in lawns, on front windows, big stickers on garbage bins, collecting petitions, which is clearly an excuse for a one-to-one -one conversation, are all opportunities for people to do both small and large actions and to gain some satisfaction about being part of a larger campaign. The one-to-one -one conversations were achieved in a myriad of ways through sports days, street stalls, asking people to sign petitions, community meetings, union um, morning teas and lunches at work, work throughs in shopping centres and neighbourhood precincts, door knocking and thousands of telephone calls with follow-up calls to the members who were undecided. And we did that again at just the last election when over 16,000 people were involved in this level of campaigning across 16 targeted seats. All those people receive training in how to do that work, how to hold those strategic and persuasive conversations with people, and that's going to be an area of increasing focus in the next few years. 
The tactics that result in one-to-one -one conversations are those that prove through the surveys carried out after the 2007 and again the 2016 election to have been those that had the highest rate of return in getting people to vote out the Conservatives. And in 2016, the campaign was to put the government last because we've got preferential voting. These are likely to be the central tactics for the next federal election. And the gathering of data on union members' views and concerns in key electorates and the art of crafting those persuasive conversations are constantly being refined and are major priorities in the campaign work. All the literature about engagement in social movements tells us that people are active and stay active when the rewards include feeling they are making a difference, that they have a sense of purpose, when they feel valued by the group, when they feel they've formed a larger social connection, and many people feel too that they are more optimistic when they are part of such a group. And this tells us something about a good coordinator. A good coordinator for this kind of work needs to be able to bring these people with them, to nurture and develop them both politically and socially. Many of the most successful groups ran these developmental workshops for their volunteers, working on members' political and economic education more broadly, as well as the specifics of the laws. And many of them had a very dynamic set of social friendships that developed over the time. A number of the groups spent quite a bit of time working on the theory of framing issues, using ideas from George Lakoff's book, Don't Think of an Elephant, which you may well be familiar with. And of course, the usual skills of how to hold conversations with people who have different views. In the light of the challenges posed by Trump in particular and populism more generally, these sorts of workshops are important to revisit, as education on basic economics and the political system is clearly an important element in shifting the views of some who may feel that Trump's way will assist them, when clearly it will make them worse off. The Australian, ACTU and Australian unions have clearly recognised we're in the era of permanent campaign mode. And while extra resources are mobilised in the lead up to the national election, they are now engaged in building the momentum by arguing strongly for our issues, those that impact so severely on the wellbeing and living standards of ordinary working folk. Already thousands of Australian workers affected by the Fair Work Commission's decision to cut penalty rates for Sunday and public holidays in the hospital, fast food and retail sector have been organising, meeting with senators from their states in the hope of convincing them to try and legislate against the Fair Work Committee decision. In the past, Australia used to have a reasonably effective no disadvantage test, but this no longer applies and with this penalty rates decision has just come the realisation of how sorely it's needed. It's particularly poignant because at the same time that the penalty rates were abolished or reduced, the government put in legislation for tax cuts for small and medium businesses. The campaign efforts in this area will feed directly into the larger campaign come election campaign time. And it's very clear that the rise in inequality in Australia has to have a central place in any ongoing or future election campaign, as it's not only severely affecting union members, but it's also providing a reason for voters to peel off and support populist candidates and parties such as Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party. As Sally McManus, our recently elected first woman ACTU secretary said, inequality in our country is the worst it's been for 70 years, and 679 of our biggest corporations pay not one cent of tax. It's now part of the business models of some Australian companies to underpay workers or to force them to pretend to be contractors. And the consequences are absolutely no disincentive, especially when the exploited workforce is too afraid to speak out. We have a problem of a power imbalance in our country. Some people have far too much of it and ordinary Australian working folk don't have enough of it. So questions about fairness and inequality in contemporary society, along with the rights of workers to a secure and dignified job, continue to be in the forefront of people's concern for their future. And the conversation with union members and members of the public must focus on who, that is which party, is best placed to act in the interests of working people and their families. The conversations we have with our political colleagues in those parties that are closely allied to the Labor movement must emphasise that they need to be seen to deliver if they are to win the votes of union members. And union members and unions must keep up public pressure on progressive parties when in government to deliver the changes they promise, as we surely know business will pressure them to limit those commitments. And these issues will be absolutely central in the thousands of one-to-one -one conversations that will be coordinated with, by Australian unions with their members in marginal seats over the next two years. And the key conversations to have are those with the voters who occupy the political middle ground, who might be persuaded to shift their vote or convinced not to drift to the right. So in summary, the key lessons from the Your Rights at Work campaign are 
Union values resonate with the public. Unions know how to win. Unions know how to engage, educate and organise members. Unions have unique access to swinging voters in key electorates. Unions are trusted by most of their members to hold conversations with them about the issues that matter deeply to them. Unions can marshal amazing resources. Unions can employ professionals to assist in identifying the issues, the framing and the messaging that resonates best across the broad community. Unions can draw on knowledge and experience from with their own membership and from other sympathetic movements. Unions have wide reach and can build identity and motivation amongst their membership. Unions can be the key factor in winning elections for progressive parties and you should all work like hell to achieve those victories. Thank you, good luck.